Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cholesterol metabolism. Okay, right, so we have now discussed at length the SREBP pathway and the results of the SREBP pathway, okay, which is that you increase the expression of HMG-CoA reductase and therefore increase the amount of cholesterol biosynthesis that you're participating in, and you increase the expression of the LDL receptor, and that increases the amount of LDL that you are endocytosing, okay, into the cell, and therefore increases the amount of cholesterol you're getting from the LDL pool. Okay, right, so those two pathways lead to cholesterol level going up in the cell when cholesterol level has fallen, which is what activates the SREBP pathway. Okay, what we now want to look at is what happens when cholesterol is too high. Okay, now I've already seen that when cholesterol is too high, you're going to shut off cholesterol biosynthesis. We've seen, remember, that cholesterol will bind to the sterile sensing domain of the HMG-CoA reductase. It will then associate with INSIG-1 or 2, and then that will result in the degradation of that HMG-CoA reductase uh, protein. Okay, so that's brilliant. Uh, but that's not actually going to solve the problem. That just stops you making the problem worse. Okay, how do we actually get rid of the excess cholesterol that we've got? Okay, uh, well, this differs depending on whether you're talking about a hepatocyte cell of the liver or a peripheral cell. Okay, so we're going to start off by discussing a hepatocyte's response to having too much cholesterol, and then we'll discuss a peripheral cell's response to having uh, too much cholesterol, and that will take us on to the reverse cholesterol transport pathway, an HDL. Okay, right. So let's start off with what a hepatocyte does if it's got too much cholesterol. So the starting point for this little pathway we're going to discuss is that cholesterol is too high. Okay, so once again, I want to give you the basic overview of this pathway, and then we'll go into the actual details of this pathway. So basically, the answer is that the liver is going to upregulate a certain enzyme which is involved in turning the cholesterol into bile acids, and therefore uh, the uh, bile acids can be converted into bile salts, and we can dump it into uh, the bile, basically. So that's how hepatocytes get rid of excess cholesterol. Okay, so what is this enzyme that you're going to upregulate the expression of? Okay, well it's a cytochrome P450 enzyme, which for short are abbreviated to CYP, like so, and specifically it's cytochrome P450 7A1. Okay, so let me just write out this enzyme's name in full then. So CYP, for those who don't know, uh, stands for cytochrome, that's the CY, okay? And then the P is for P450, and there are a huge number of enzymes that are mainly expressed in the liver, uh, which are classified as cytochrome P450 enzymes. And the specific one that we're interested in is cytochrome P450 7A1. Okay, so when cholesterol is too high within the hepatocyte, your response to that is going to be to increase the expression of cytochrome P457A1 within the hepatocyte, and this then is going to convert the excess cholesterol into bile acids, which of course we know uh, can then be converted into bile salts. So remember, the bile acids are cholic acid and chenodeoxycholic acid. Okay, right. So, how then does too much cholesterol within the hepatocyte actually lead to an increase in the expression of cytochrome P457A1? Okay, what is the mechanism? Okay, well, of course, it's going to have to involve some sort of uh, transcription factor, and indeed it does. Okay, so let me now introduce you then to the transcription factors that are going to be involved in this pathway. Okay, so the transcription factors that are going to be involved are what are known as liver X receptors. Okay, and these are going to be important also in the response to too high cholesterol in peripheral cells. Okay, so liver X receptors then are for short abbreviated down to the LXRs. Okay, so a liver X receptor will be abbreviated to an LXR. L for liver, X for X, and then R for receptor. Okay, now there are two major different types of liver X receptor, okay? There is the liver X receptor alpha, 
okay? And then there is the liver X receptor beta, okay? So there is LXR alpha and LXR beta, and these are expressed in different tissues, but they do pretty much the same thing. So liver X receptor alpha is predominantly expressed within the liver. Okay, so the liver is going to have a lot of liver X receptor alpha, whereas many peripheral tissues are not really going to express liver X receptor alpha. Liver X receptor beta, on the other hand, is found uh, in basically all tissues. Okay, so it has a much broader uh, expression than liver X receptor alpha. Okay, so in the liver, then, we're going to have both liver X receptor alpha and liver X receptor beta, because all tissues includes the liver, okay? So, uh, both of these are going to be involved in the response to too high cholesterol in the liver. When we come on to peripheral cells, it's only going to be liver X receptor beta that's really uh, important elsewhere. Okay, right. But as I say, both liver X receptor alpha and beta, they pretty much do the same thing. Okay, and basically they are transcription uh, factors, okay? However, they don't operate alone. They dimerize with another very important transcription factor. Okay, so let me just discuss this. So I'm going to draw out some DNA here. Okay, so once again, these two parallel lines don't represent our cell membrane, they represent some DNA. Okay, and let's have some gene here that's going to be controlled by the liver X receptor transcription factors. Okay, so here is some gene that's going to be controlled by these liver X receptor transcription factors. And then what that means is that in this portion upstream of the gene, the gene control region, you're going to have to have a certain sequence of organic bases that allows the liver X receptor and its partner transcription factor to bind there. Okay, and I'll just make it bigger so that I can show it more easily on the picture. Okay, and this sequence of amino acids that you need to have in your gene control region in order to uh, bind these liver X receptor transcription factors is what's known as the liver X receptor element, so the LXR element here. Okay, so you'll have one of these LXR elements somewhere within your gene control region of this gene if it's going to be controlled by liver X receptors. Okay, so the liver X receptor can then bind to this liver X receptor element, but it doesn't do it alone. It does it as a heterodimer. Okay, so here, let's say this is the liver X receptor here. Okay, and I'll just colour in that liver X receptor in, in blue. So what's the, its partner? What does it bind to? Okay, well, the other protein that it dimerizes with to form the actual thing which can bind to the liver X receptor is something called RXR, and what this stands for is the retinoid X receptor, okay, which is capable of binding to all transretinoic acid, okay, which is a molecule very much so related to vitamin A. Okay, right, but we're not going to worry about what the ligand for the retinoid X receptor is, because we're going to be concerned with the ligand for the liver X receptor. Okay, now, the liver X receptor retinoid X receptor heterodimer here is all the time bound to the liver X receptor elements upstream of certain genes in the genome. So a bunch of genes in the genome, usually 100 to 200, will have uh, a liver X receptor element in their gene control regions. Okay, And these liver X receptor retinoid X receptor heterodimers are bound there all the time. Now usually, before activation of the liver X receptor, these heterodimers are inhibiting the gene expression of the downstream genes. Okay, so they stop all the expression of the downstream genes. Okay, and as I say, we're not going to go through the mechanisms by which transcription factors uh, exert this control, but for our purposes, it's enough to just say it does it. Okay, now. What's going to happen is when cholesterol is going to go up, a certain other type of molecule is going to go up, and I'll give you that other type of molecule now. So when cholesterol goes up in the cell, basically the level of molecules known as oxysterols also go up. Okay, so cholesterol is not the direct ligand for the liver X receptor, but derivatives of cholesterol known as oxysterols are. Okay, so when cholesterol goes up in the cell, you also get oxysterols going up in the cell, and these are basically the ligand for the liver X receptor. 
So oxysterols can bind to the liver X receptor. They cause a change in conformation in that liver X receptor within the liver X receptor retinoid X receptor heterodimer here. Okay, and now that heterodimer goes from inhibiting the expression of the downstream gene to suddenly increasing the expression of the downstream gene. Okay, and then one of the downstream genes that it's going to increase the expression of is going to be our cytochrome P457A1, okay, and therefore in the hepatocytes, um, the um, cytochrome P457A1 is going to go up, and therefore the cholesterol is going to be converted into bile acids and then bile salts, and that's how we're going to get rid of this excess cholesterol within our hepatocyte. Okay, right, so that's what happens in the hepatocytes. In peripheral cells, it is different proteins that you're going to increase the expression of, but the pathway is exactly the same. Okay, so now let's talk about peripheral cells, and I'll just get another piece of paper to do this. Okay, so that's more what happens in hepatocytes. They upregulate this enzyme and thereby convert the uh, cholesterol into bile acids. Okay, what happens in peripheral cells then now when they get too much cholesterol? And this will take us on to the topic of reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, right, so peripheral cells then. Okay, so the pathway is exactly the same, so I'll bring it back again. Okay, so in peripheral cells you also have these liver X receptor, retinoid X receptor, heterodimers on the liver X receptor elements upstream of uh, certain genes within the genome. Okay, and usually they inhibit the expression of those genes, okay, but if you bind the ligand of liver X receptor to the liver X receptor, which is these oxysterols, which are derivatives of cholesterol, then suddenly it can change to activating the expression of genes. Okay, so if cholesterol gets too high in these peripheral cells, then you're going to get oxysterols building up. These are going to bind to the liver X receptor, which will be a liver X receptor beta in the case of peripheral cells. Okay, and then you're going to now start getting the activation of certain genes, uh, which are now going to start being expressed. Okay, and in peripheral cells, you're not going to start expressing uh, cytochrome P457A1, but you do start expressing two important transporters, which are of the ABC family of transporters. Okay, so two transporters are going to start being expressed, which are ABCA1, okay, and also ABCG1, okay. So both of these transporters are transporters basically for cholesterol, and they're within a massive great family of ATP-driven transporters known as the ABC family of transporters. So what does ABC actually stand for? It stands for ATP, that's the A, binding, and then the C is for cassette. Okay, so the APC uh, transporter stands for the ATP binding cassette transporters. Okay, and as I say, they are all active transporters, primary active transporters, uh, which uh, couple the hydrolysis of ATP to the movement of some substrate. Well, I say all of them are primary active transporters, not quite all of them. There is the CFTR protein, which is a member of the ATP binding cassette transporters, which isn't an active transporter, but is rather an ATP gated chloride channel. But most ABC transporters are primary active transporters, which couple the movement of some substrate to the hydrolysis of ATP. Okay, right. So if I draw a picture then here, Okay, here is our peripheral cell here, okay, and it's overloaded with cholesterol, so there's too much cholesterol in this cell, okay, so what it's now expressed is these two transporters, which I'll show here, okay, like so. So one of these can represent the ABCA1 here, okay, and the other can represent ABCG1, and let's just colour them in so that it looks more interesting, okay, so here is ABCA1 here in orange, and then we'll have ABCG1 here in vivid purple. Okay, right, and these are both capable of pumping cholesterol out of the cell. Okay, so out can come 
cholesterol molecules, which I'll just abbreviate as C molecules. And every time it pumps a cholesterol molecule out, each one of these will consume an ATP molecule. So it will hydrolyze ATP down to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, well that's a very crude solution to the problem. Okay, we've got too much cholesterol in the cell, so let's just put transporters on the cell membrane to pump the cholesterol out. But that's what these peripheral cells are going to start doing. Okay, the problem then comes with what's going to now happen to this cholesterol. Because you can't just let it accumulate in the extracellular space. Okay, so what now has to happen? is this cholesterol somehow needs to get loaded back into LDL particles within the blood. Okay, and if I go back to my initial outline of this entire story, okay, the bit that we are now looking at is this portion here, where peripheral cells can put cholesterol back into the LDL pool. They can put cholesterol into LDL particles in the blood. Okay, and this is called reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, right. Uh, so, it's not direct, okay? LDL particles do not just come here and take up the cholesterol. Instead, what first happens is the cholesterol goes into HDL particles, and then the HDL particles give the cholesterol to the LDL particles. Okay, so, we now need to study the next lipoprotein that we're going to study in this video, which is HDL. And we will study all five of the ones I talked about, okay, but it's just that chylomicrons and VLDL and IDL are coming up later. Okay, the next one we're going to study is HDL. Okay, so, high-density lipoprotein then. Okay, right, so I need to now tell you about HDL. We had an in-depth study of LDL before we actually uh, used it. Now we need our in-depth study of HDL. Okay, right, so, HDL is synthesized in the liver, okay, and then secreted into the blood. And the pathways by which liver cells uh, actually produce lipoproteins like HDL are not very well understood. Okay, so the way that you actually build these things, we don't really know much about that. I will say more about that when we come on to the production of chylomicrons by enterocytes. Okay, and the pathway for HDL will be very similar, but we don't know that much about the actual uh, production of these uh, things at the moment, okay, how you actually build them, how you get them to build. Okay, right, but liver cells do produce HDL particles, and when they secrete them into the blood, the HDL particles are in a form known as an HDL disc, okay, and this is because when they're secreted, they don't look at all like a nice full sphere, instead they look like a disc. So let me show you an HDL disc. And the reason they look like a disc is because their inners are not full, basically. They have an empty core. They literally just consist of the phospholipid monomer with apolipoproteins in, but they have nothing inside them when they're initially secreted. Okay, so firstly let me put the apolipoproteins in. Okay, so if you can remember back to when we were discussing um, lipoproteins in general, the apolipoprotein that is key for you to know about HDL particles having is apolipoprotein A1. Okay, so that's the one that is absolutely key to know about, and we will see why knowing about apolipoprotein A1 is so important in just a moment. Okay, I'm not saying that's the only apolipoprotein HDL particles have, but that's the most important one to know about. It's definitely not the only one they have, they have more. Okay, and they can have multiple copies of apolipoprotein A1, it's not a case that they can only have one. Okay, because it's a much smaller protein than apolipoprotein B100. That one's a massive, great giant that dominates the LDL particle, and you really just can't fit two apolipoprotein B100s into an LDL particle. Okay, right. So here are our apolipoprotein A1s then. Okay, and then the uh, monolayer then is going to mainly consist of um, lecithin molecules or other phospholipids, maybe with a little bit of cholesterol in there as well, okay, but mainly phospholipids, 
Okay, so this is really the structure of these uh, HDL particles when they're secreted by the liver cells. Okay, they have nothing in their core, and therefore that they are these flat discs which consist just of the outer phospholipid monolayer here. So let me now just colour in these phospholipid monolayers. Okay, well, these phospholipids in the phospholipid monolayer. So here are all of their hydrophobic, uh, sorry, polar heads. Okay, and here are all of their hydrophobic tails in orange here. Okay, right. Uh, so this is what's known as an HDL disc, and this is going to be secreted by hepatocytes into the blood. Okay, now, it is these HDL discs, then, that are going to take cholesterol from these peripheral cells that are pumping the cholesterol out, basically. Okay, so they are going to go over here, and they're going to take these cholesterol molecules from these peripheral cells. And this really is the portion that is referred to as reverse cholesterol transport, this transportation out of the cell onto HDL particles. This is the bit that is called reverse cholesterol transport, although we'll refer to reverse cholesterol transport as the full pathway by which you can get the cholesterol first into the HDL particles and then into the LDL particles. Okay, right. So the cholesterol is going to be transported into these HDL discs then. Okay, now at the moment this is free cholesterol that these cells are pumping out. Okay, so it will now have that amphipathic structure and therefore it won't go into the centre of the HDL, it will just go into the outer portion. Okay, so it will have its a polar group facing out to the external world, and then its hydrophobic group sets pointing into the centre, basically. Okay, so here are the cholesterol molecules integrating into our HDL disc. Okay, so now what's going to happen is we're going to start thinning the core of this HDL disc with cholesterol esters. Okay, now how do we convert the cholesterol molecules in the uh, phospholipid monomer of this HDL disc into cholesterol esters? Well, this involves a really important protein that is floating around in the blood called LCAT, okay, which can bind to HDL particles. Okay, so what does LCAT stand for? So LCAT is short for lecithin, that's the L, and then cholesterol, that's the C, and then it's lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, that's the AT. Okay, now, this is a protein that is free within the blood, okay, and which is put into the blood by the liver. So hepatocytes put this protein into the blood, okay, and it is capable of binding to apolipoprotein A1 on the surface of the HDL particles, like our HDL disc here. Okay, and that's why it's really important to actually know about apolipoprotein A1, because it serves this important function. So, let me show it here. So here now is our methylene cholesterol acyl transferase protein binding onto the outside of the HDL particle by binding to the apolipoprotein A1. So both of them are in the blood, and therefore uh, the LCAT can gain access to the apolipoprotein A1. Okay, right. Um, so now, what does the lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase catalyze? Well, it's going to catalyze the production of cholesterol esters from phospholipids, basically, specifically from the phospholipid lecithin. Okay, so let me now draw out this chemical reaction that's going to be catalyzed. So firstly, let me start off by drawing my cartoon of lecithin once again. So I'll just remind you of the structure of lecithin. So remember, lecithin was also called phosphatidylcholine, and it was a phosphatidic acid molecule attached to a choline molecule. Okay, so let me highlight in the different structures here. So in orange, these are representing the two long-chain carboxylic acids, the two hydrophobic tails of the lecithin molecule, which are attached to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and then off the alcohol group that comes off the third carbon here, we have a phosphate group, okay, linked by phosphoester linkage to the glycerol molecule, and then attached to the phosphatidic acid molecule, which is what you've got previously there, okay, 
again via a phosphoester linked to the other alcohol group, or that phosphate group, we then have the choline molecule. Okay, and this full structure then now is called lecithin or phosphatidylcholine. Okay, and this is one of the main phospholipids uh, that will be uh, a constituent of this uh, phospholipid monomer of the HDL disc. Okay, now let's just draw out our uh, cholesterol molecule again. Okay, I'm trying to decide whether I'll draw the full cholesterol molecule or just represent it as a square. I think I'll just represent it as a square. So we'll represent our cholesterol molecule as a red square here. And we know that the cholesterol molecule has that important alcohol group, okay, which I'll colour in in purple down here. Okay, so there's the alcohol group, that one polar group of the cholesterol molecule. Okay, so these are the two starting points, and of course we've got loads of the two starting points for this reaction. We've got loads of lecithin in the, in the phospholipid monomer of the HDL disc here, and we've also now got lots of free cholesterol because the HDL disc has accepted the cholesterol from these peripheral cells. Okay, now what's going to happen is the LCAT is going to catalyze a reaction between these two. And the reaction that's going to occur is you're going to cut this long chain carboxylic acid here off from the lecithin molecule. You're going to split the bond between this long chain carboxylic acid and the alcohol group of the second carbon of the glycerol molecule. Okay, so you're going to break that bond. You're then going to transfer this long chain carboxylic acid onto uh, the alcohol group of this cholesterol molecule here to create a cholesterol ester. Okay, so let's now draw the products that we'll get from this. So we'll start with the cholesterol ester here. So here's the hydrophobic portion of the cholesterol molecule, and now it's going to have a long chain carboxylic acid linked onto it to make us a cholesterol ester, which we know is an extremely hydrophobic molecule. Okay, it's not going to be able to sit in the uh, phospholipid monolayer of the HDL particle anymore. It's going to drop into the core, basically. Okay, so I'll just label up our components of this reaction then. So here is our cholesterol molecule. Okay, now we've got our cholesterol ester here. Okay, and then what's the other product that we're going to get? Well, we're going to get what's left over from lecithin after you've cut off that uh, middle long chain carboxylic acid. Uh, so I'll draw this here, okay, like so. And this molecule is called lysolecithin, okay, or lysophosphatidylcholine, okay, whichever you prefer. Okay, right, or one word. Uh, so let's just colour those portions in. So here is one remaining long chain carboxylic acid group attached to the alcohol group of the first carbon of the glycerol molecule. Here in green is the glycerol molecule. We've still got the phosphate group coming off the third uh, carbon's alcohol group. Okay, and then we'll have the choline molecule still there in blue. Okay, right. So this is the reaction then that lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase is capable of catalyzing. Okay, and the result of this is that you're going to convert lecithin molecules in the uh, phospholipid monomer into lysolecithin molecules, and those still have the same basic properties. They're still phospholipids. Okay, they still have a lipid group here and a phosphate group. Okay, so they still have a hydrophobic portion and a polar portion, and therefore are still amphipathic, so they can still perform their role as part of the phospholipid monomer. Okay, you're now using um, the cholesterol molecules to produce cholesterol ester molecules, however, and those will now drop from the phospholipid monomer into the core. Okay, so what's going to start happening is you're going to start forming an HDL sphere rather than an HDL disc. Okay, so let me now draw the HDL sphere here. Okay, so once again, here is the apolipoprotein A1 in the phospholipid monolayer here, okay, in blue. Okay, uh, then you'll have your uh, phospholipids making up the phospholipid monolayer here. You'll still have a few cholesterol molecules, and I won't draw the entire thing. Okay, so I'll just put a few representatives of the phospholipid monolayer here. So there are their polar phosphate groups, there are their uh, hydrophobic acyl chains, and then we'll have a few free cholesterol molecules still within the phospholipid monolayer there. 
Okay, but now the big change is that in the hydrophobic core, we now have lots of these cholesterol esters. Okay, so here is the cholesterol molecule. Okay, and here is the long chain carboxylic acid attached there. Okay, and for short, I'll abbreviate cholesterol ester down to CE again. Okay, so this structure that we're now creating, this is going to be called an HDL sphere. So the HDL discs are going to become HDL spheres through accepting uh, cholesterol molecules from peripheral cells in this reverse cholesterol transport process. Okay, and then through the actions of lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, basically. Okay, right. Now what can happen is the cholesterol esters in these HDL particles can be uh, transferred into LDL particles. Let me now show this. Okay, so I said that reverse cholesterol transport overall is going to deliver this cholesterol that these peripheral cells have excreted to the LDL pool, not to the HDL pool. Okay, and we're about to see how it ends up eventually delivering them to the LDL pool. Okay, so let me now draw my HDL particle here. Okay, so here's my HDL sphere. Okay, and now what's going to happen is it's going to transfer them to the bigger LDL particle. So remember, LDL is bigger than HDL. Okay, so here is uh, a LDL particle here. Right, uh, and I'll just put in uh, the apolipoproteins that are important here. So we'll put in uh, the apolipoprotein B100, the giant that dominates the LDL particle here. And we'll have that, as always, represented in turquoise here. Then we'll have the apolipoprotein A1, which is the key apolipoprotein of HDL particles here in blue. Okay, and now the key thing that's going to happen is that cholesterol esters in the core of the HDL particle here. Okay, and I'll just colour these in. So here's the cholesterol molecule. Here is the acyl chain attached to the cholesterol molecule. These cholesterol esters are going to be transferred from the HDL particle here to the LDL particle here. Okay, and the way this is going to occur is for a protein called cholesterol ester transfer protein, which basically is a protein that's in the blood and which can bridge the gap between the HDL particle and the LDL particle. It's capable of sticking itself into uh, the HDL particle and also the LDL particle, and it can transfer cholesterol esters from the HDL particle into the LDL particle. Okay, so this protein is for short abbreviated down to the CETP protein. Okay, and that stands for cholesterol ester, okay, which we know can be abbreviated to CE. And then transfer protein is what the TP stands for. Okay, right. So this is the way then that cholesterol esters can be moved from HDL particles into LDL particles. Okay, and don't you see the brilliance of this, which is that once the HDL particle has now had its belly emptied, basically, by moving the cholesterol esters into the LDL particles, this HDL particle can then go on and accept more cholesterol, uh, sorry, cholesterol molecules from other cells, okay, and then turn them into cholesterol esters and then transfer them to LDL particles. So this process can continue on and on. The HDL is very much so reusable. Okay, it's obviously not reusable forever because eventually it'll run out of lecithin, okay, but it can be reused a lot basically. Okay, so HDL particles then, their function is in shuttling cholesterol molecules from peripheral cells into LDL particles. So taking cholesterol from peripheral cells and putting it back into the LDL pool. Okay, and that process is what's overall called reverse cholesterol transport. Okay, right, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll then go back now and look at uh, the exogenous pathway, the pathway by which 
dietary cholesterol from the intestine can get to the uh, hepatocytes of the liver, and then the endogenous pathway, whereby when the liver is in the fed state and has many, many nutrients uh, currently at high levels inside it, it can then uh, send cholesterol to the LDL pool. Okay, and that's called the endogenous pathway. So we'll do that in the next video.